The gospel reading this morning follows directly on Jesus' teaching about the lost, including the, the lost sheep. How many remember Ben, the sheep from last week? Best part of worship. And the lost coin and, the, and the, the parable of the prodigal. And so immediately following the parable of the prodigal, Jesus is still speaking to the disciples. Then Jesus said to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager and charges were brought to him that this man was squandering his property. So the rich man summoned the manager and said to him, what is this I hear about you? Give me an accounting of your management because you cannot be my manager any longer. And the manager said to himself, what will I do now that my master is taking the position away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do so that when I am dismissed as manager, people may welcome me into their homes. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he asked the first, how much do you owe my master? And he answered, a hundred jugs of oil. The manager said to him, take your bill, sit down quickly and make it 50. Then he asked another, how much do you owe? And he replied, a hundred containers of wheat. The manager said to him, take your bill and make it 80. And his master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth. So when it is gone, they may welcome you into the eternal homes. Whoever is faithful in very little is faithful also in much, and whoever is dishonest in little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful with dishonest wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to another, who will give you what is your own? No slave can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all this, and they ridiculed him. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. All right. Alleluia, alleluia. 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 This is the word of the living God. of eternal life. Hallelujah, hallelujah. This is the word of the living God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. You have the words of eternal life. Hallelujah, hallelujah. When I went back to school for the first time, Ted offered to take over the household finances. Did he stick around? Is he still here? Sometimes he stays for a second service. I don't see him. I'm not going to really talk about him behind his back, other than to say that he has handled our household finances very capably ever since he took them over from me those years ago. We partner in our financial planning decisions, but Ted does such a good job with the daily stuff that I don't pay any attention to it other than to do my part to live within our means. This, earlier this month, Ted was gone out of the country for two weeks and a bank overdraft notice came in the mail, which is really unusual. On the one hand, I don't really worry that much. You all know that sometimes the incoming money and the outgoing money aren't timed very well, and things will resolve themselves in a matter of 24 hours or so. But on the other hand, that overdraft notice felt like a punch in the gut. 
a direct blow to that place inside that's reserved for money anxiety. Now, perhaps some of you aren't familiar with money anxiety, and for that, I admittedly will dive into a deep well of the sin of envy on your behalf. <laughs> but for the rest of us, you know that place I'm talking about. It's either in your gut or right behind your breastbone. And that money anxiety can get stirred up by all kinds of things, like an overdraft notice, or more bills than you have paycheck, a crack in your water heater or your foundation, a car that dies permanently, medical or veterinary expenses, a job loss, a dip in the market, an economic downturn. Some, for some of us, just saying 2008 out loud requires a trigger warning, am I right? Money anxiety has the capacity to bring us to our knees and to rock the core of our sense of security like few things can. And Jesus hardly helps. Jesus talks about money more than anything but the kingdom of God, and when he does, we get a twinge right in our money anxiety place. In passages like this morning's parable, we know that Jesus is poking at something poking at our inclination to place our security in money, poking at our inclination to want to hold tight to what we have, poking at our inclination to value ourselves based on our financial success, poking at our careful budgets and our safeguarded savings and our retirement accounts, and so on. Frankly, Jesus rarely feels more threatening than he does when he starts coming after our relationship to money. In this parable, Jesus starts with a rather straightforward story. A master gets wind of the fact that his manager is cheating him. So the master tells the manager to be prepared to show him the books because he's fired. The manager can't imagine living a life of labor or begging, so he meets all of the people who owe the master money and makes their lives just a little bit easier in hopes that they will take him in when the master turns him out. Then things start getting a little bit murky. When you go home, look at verse 9. If we could just scratch verse 9 out, this whole reading would be a lot easier to deal with. Is Jesus really telling us to use dishonest money to make friends? And seriously, read 9. Is he really telling us that? And is Jesus really implying that those friends then have the capacity to offer us some kind of eternal benefit? And then we kind of climb out of the murk and things clear up a little bit. If you're trusty, trustworthy or not in small things, you will be trustworthy or not in big things. And by the way, you cannot serve God and wealth. It's a circuitous, meandering story that is clearly about money, maybe about who your friends are, and possibly about eternity, but we're still not really sure. So if you're sitting at home by yourself reading this story, it would be easy to follow any single verse down a rabbit hole to a place that was never intended by Jesus or by Luke. For example, when I was a sophomore in college, there was an upperclassman named Vince that I really looked up to. He was very active in the faith-based outreach teams that did youth lock-ins, concerts, and led worship all over the northwestern Minnesota and eastern North Dakota. Did you notice I didn't mention the name of the college? But you still know what I'm talking about, don't you? Just a little shout out. So one day, Vince had apparently been reading the Bible alone, and he came to this passage about not being able to serve God and wealth, and Vince recognized how much money he had spent on building an impressive music collection, and it was all vinyl in those days. It took a lot of money and a lot of space. So in his earnest desire to keep his focus on God and not on his vinyl, Vince gave away his entire album collection. We were all confused. 
Vince was first and foremost a musician. I, I, I sense nausea from this corner. Um, it, he was first and foremost a musician. Could it really be that giving away his collection of life-giving music was, was what Jesus meant about this verse? Now, had Vince been studying the Bible with others, had he shared his questions and invited the wisdom and faithfulness of others into the conversation, he might have been able to think differently about this passage before hundreds And I mean hundreds of albums were snatched up by eager friends who also loved God, but saw no conflict between loving God and walking away with an armload of free music. I think my microphone is clipping in and out. Are you guys hearing it too? No? Okay. It's just me. Maybe my hearing is clipping in and out. This fall, we're doing a quick revisit of our five core values, and today we're looking at the core value of lifelong faith formation. Our commitment at Trinity to lifelong faith formation recognizes that we are never done growing in faith. We are so committed to your faith formation that we call the full-time pastor of lifelong faith formation. Yay. Thank you. He's awesome. But none of us are ever done growing in faith. None of us. Not even those of us who are trained and credentialed to be pastors and teachers. We all continue to be remade in faith every day, growing more deeply in love with God, following Jesus more courageously. And we believe that that happens most effectively, most most healthfully, most productively in community. So while we're encouraged to take time for personal prayer and Bible reading and devotion, we are also called by the Word of God into communal study of Scripture, interpretation of the world, and how we as people of God are called to respond. For example, are we really asked to give away our album collection? Some years ago, the ELCA recognized that many of us are reluctant to admit our feelings of inadequacy when it comes to the Bible. Inadequate to study, to open, to read. We don't even know which version of the Bible to buy. So the ELCA's Bible Book of Faith initiative has launched a renewed interest in and commitment to helping us get to know this remarkable faith-forming book. The Book of Faith initiative is is founded on the Lutheran approach to reading and interpreting Scripture. I'm going to share that with you. First, we interpret Scripture as both law and gospel. God's living word comes to us as both judgment, admonition, exhortation, caution, law, treatment, rules, and it comes to us as salvation, grace, love, and welcome. Secondly, Lutherans emphasize the principle of sola scriptura, scripture alone. How many of you remember that big banner we had that had all the solas up on it when we were celebrating the 500th anniversary of the Reformation? Sola scriptura does not reject reason and experience, but it holds the Bible as the authoritative source for knowing the divine truth that God gives to us. Third, Martin Luther taught that there is a distinction between passages to be interpreted literally and passages to be interpreted figuratively. Lutherans teach that Scripture is to be interpreted in its plain sense. Plain sense, that is the meaning most obvious to the original intended audience. There are, and and hear this, and say this with confidence out in the world, there are no secrets and no coded messages hiding in the passages of the Bible. They are not there. And finally, Lutherans teach that the Bible is God's word for all people. It's not a magic book with private messages for a few or for one. It is for all people, and Lutherans support a public interpretation, public interpretation that listens for what God is saying to Israel and to the body of Christ. When Vince finally sat with others to explore the plain, 
public community meeting of this Bible passage, he realized he had made a terrible, terrible mistake. It cost him more money than he cares to admit to reacquire that life-giving collection of music that continues to inspire his work and service to God. And even so, Vince now considers himself blessed by the faith-forming experience of shared Bible study and holy conversation in the body of Christ. Here at Trinity, our commitment to lifelong faith formation is twofold. First, we as the body of Christ hold a shared commitment to respect and support the ongoing faith formation of every person. We welcome each other no matter where we are on our journey with God, whether we are on a journey with God, whether we have left the journey with God or are still discovering one, and we assume no person to be finished with that earthly journey of forming faith until we finally join God in our heavenly home. We all learn and grow all of our lives. Second, we are committed to offering time, space, and opportunity for every person to learn, to be curious, ask questions, express doubt, wrestle with scripture and the world, and to participate in holy conversation and faithful discovery. So back to that parable, the parable that hits right there in that money anxiety space. Jesus suggests that the way that we relate to money is to be surprising and subversive. In a culture where riches were seen as God's special blessing, Jesus is proposing another way of thinking about money. Money is not for our personal blessing. It is not for our own benefit, but for the benefit of neighbor, for the benefit of relationship, and for the service of God. And that threatens the powerful who rest comfortably on their unjust wealth. The truth of the parable is that money is just one example of how perilous life with Jesus can be. Jesus calls us to ways of life that are frequently seen as subversive and often, if not always, at odds with the demands and expectations of more popular culture. How we use our money, how we open our doors to our neighbors, how we speak up for the oppressed, how we hang out on Sunday mornings with a crowd that includes anybody who walks in the door, and how we are constantly striving to reach beyond our walls in love and inclusion and justice. The call to live among the people of Jesus is strange and countercultural and it demands things of our time and our talent and our money. But it is the call of God, God who reaches out to us constantly, shaping us as those who live loved and loving. And as we make our way along this faith-forming journey, our great joy, our great blessing and privilege is that no one no one needs to walk it alone. Thanks be to God. Amen.